Hey, good evening and welcome in A-Push Nation to yet another Fireside Chat. Uh, this evening our topic is going to stay on course with what we've been doing uh, the past couple of days and of course what we did before the Thanksgiving break and that's going to be on the rising sectionalism crisis that Congress, the presidents, and the people of the United States are facing in the antebellum period. Just keep in mind that antebellum term is again pre-Civil War. Now when it comes to sectionalism, we know that a big piece of the sectionalism puzzle uh, was added when Manifest Destiny became a pervasive idea starting in the late 1830s, and that spilt over very much into the 1840s and early 1850s. Tonight, I'm going to discuss with you guys how Manifest Destiny worked outside the United States just as much as it did inside the, the continent of North America. <clears throat> and we're first going to talk about a pivotal event that not only shaped American history, but also foreign and world history, and that is the arrival of the United States in Japan in 1853. So it all begins in 1852 under uh, accidental President Millard Fillmore, who of course took over from Zachary Taylor when he died shortly after being elected president. Fillmore commissioned a naval officer named Matthew Perry, who had the title Commodore. So his rank was Commodore and his name was Matthew Perry. Hey, just like the actor on Friends. But Matthew Perry's journey to Japan from the United States was historical in many ways. First of all, if you think back to world history, Japan was still undergoing a period known as the Tokugawa Shogunate. And during the Tokugawa Shogunate, Japan was isolated from the rest of the world. It allowed only the Dutch to trade in its ports, and the Japanese were very much isolated from, from the rest of the world. However, infused with Manifest Destiny, the United States, in one of its first times in, in its, the country's history, began to look to expand its interest on a global stage. And with Commodore Perry's journey to Japan, the second most important thing about that journey is not only does it break down the barrier with the Japanese, but it also indicates how America will become very much tied to shipping technology, in particular the steam engine, which is a relatively new innovation uh, starting from the 1830s and 40s. And the steam engine powered America's Navy and Commodore Perry and his ships all the way across the Pacific and into the islands of Japan. Now, by the time Perry arrived, in Japan, it was near 1853. Uh, Millard Fillmore was no longer president. In fact, that president, the new president, was Franklin Pierce. More on him later. But as far as Perry's arrival, it was truly shocking from a Japanese standpoint. You have to remember the Japanese were completely isolated from world affairs. And so with this, with this show of America's military might arriving literally on its doorsteps off the shores of ports like Nagasaki and Shinado, the United States was showing an unbelievable amount of force and strength in the, in the face of the Japanese, who, oh, by the way, were going through a very transitional period in its leadership. The previous uh, shogun had died, and his young son uh, was a sickly boy and could not rule with very much force. And so Japan's government was really um, in the hands of the wrong people at the wrong time. And when Perry arrived, the United States used a technique that's known as gunboat diplomacy. But more or less, whatever your take is, gunboat diplomacy becomes a very much uh, important part of America's foreign affairs moving into the end of the 19th century. And essentially, we would try to muscle our way into Japan, and that's exactly what happens with Commodore Perry's arrival. The United States fleet under Perry's uh, leadership essentially forces its way into Japan uh, by, with the threat of war. Uh, and in 1854, the United States and the Japanese uh, signed a treaty that allows for a peaceful coexistence and for the United States to have trade relations uh, in Japan. And not only will the United States gain trade relations through the Treaty of Kanagawa, um, that was the name of the treaty, Kanagawa, the United States also set up a consul uh, in Japan, so it had a U.S. representative uh, on the Japanese islands. Again, this has unbelievable and unequivocal repercussions. The Japanese were now so in a position, thanks to the United States' uh, force, show of force, their gunboat diplomacy. The Japanese were now, for the first time in over 300 plus years, inter, uh, intermixing and trading and relating with a foreign nation other than the Dutch. So 
the United States will become the first country to gain access to Japan's trade. And this will have a domino-like effect throughout most of Asia. And once the United States signed the Treaty of uh, Kanagawa with the Japanese, the Japanese began to fold under the pressure from other countries like Britain and other European powers like France would begin to then likewise sign their own treaties with the Japanese government. And the Japanese government in less than a decade or so after the arrival of Commodore Perry will forever change uh, and it will then go under what's known as the Meiji Restoration where ironically all things American and all things Western become much desired by the Japanese. Now, no, no laughing matter here. The, the wheels that are set in motion by Commodore Perry's arrival in, in the 1853, if you flash forward about 90 so years, it is undeniable how Perry's arrival in Japan in the 1850s set the United States and the Japanese on a collision course for Pearl Harbor. There's no denying that. Our arrival in Japan opens them up to Western influence and Western uh, trade, and that will change Japan and the United States forever. So incredible amount of foreshadowing from event that you may not have even heard of. Now, speaking of other countries the United States was looking to sink its claws in, the United States in 1854, with Franklin Pierce as president, mind you, and Pierce, by the way, kind of an interesting story, when he was elected in 1852, Franklin Pierce was the youngest president ever elected at the time. He was 48 years old. He was also the first president to give an inauguration address uh, off memory. He didn't use any prepared speech. He just sort of won it. And he refused to put his hand on the Bible when he was sworn in uh, to, to the, and took the oath of office. Instead, he put it on a, a book of law. Kind of weird Franklin Pierce cocktail party knowledge for you there. Pierce was a northerner from the state of New Hampshire, but interestingly, he was a Democrat. And we know that, that in the north, the, the, the predominant party were the Whigs. But Pierce was part of this young American faction of the Democrat Party. They were known as the Young Americans because they supported Manifest Destiny and they supported the expansion of slavery, uh, which we know was already a hotbed topic at the time. Now, I mention all this about Pierce because he's an interesting president in a sense. A lot goes on in his presidency, but historians have a very negative impression of him. Uh, he's actually ranked as one of the lowest president, uh, worst presidents in U.S. history, despite the fact that a lot did happen. And one of the most important events to fit the theme of our conversation tonight is when in 1854, Pierce supported and members of Congress launched a bid to purchase Cuba from the Spanish government. Now, why would the United States want Cuba? Uh, first of all, Cuba was a slave-rich colony of the Spanish Empire. And for years, Cuba had been the, the hub of the Spanish Empire slave trade. So with slavery already entrenched in Cuba, the United States looked at Cuba as a grand opportunity to increase and spread slavery beyond the continental United States. And with Cuba's rich resources like sugar, it was a business and lucrative opportunity that the United States young Democrats or young Americans, as they were called, like Franklin Pierce, sought to go after. Now, the literature written in Congress that supported the purchase of Cuba from Spain was known as the Ostend Manifesto, the Ostend Manifesto. And this was published in 1854. And essentially what it called for was the United States would purchase Cuba from Spain for about $125 million. And Pierce went as far as sending numerous diplomats across the pond to speak to representatives in France and England and Spain to see if, if the, to, to, to negotiate if, in fact, the Spanish balked at the United States' efforts to purchase uh, Cuba, and in turn, uh, there could be a European conflict involving the United States. Well, you know the deal. Cuba is not part of the United States today. Uh, our history with Cuba will go on much further than the Ostend Manifesto, but it's, it's another piece of the puzzle uh, <clears throat> about sectionalism, about Manifest Destiny, the young American uh, movement in the Democrat Party that clues us into the divide between North and South, the spread of slavery continues to be an issue, and it will continue to be so in Franklin Pierce's presidency. We'll talk more about that this week. The last thing I'd like to talk to you guys about, though, is a little bit of irony. We know the United States wanted to push Manifest Destiny as far as it possibly could uh, from sea to sea in the United States, and with the opening of Japan by Commodore Perry, and the attempt to purchase Cuba from uh, Spain, 
But yet, within the boundaries of the United States, America's nativist movement was growing larger and larger as the 1840s and 1850s um, ran its course. We talked about nativism before. That was the very anti-immigrant, very anti-Catholic uh, sentiment that was aroused in the United States due to an influx of immigrants in the early 1800s. But a major boom of immigration uh, occurred in the 1840s when thousands upon thousands of Irish Catholics were flocking to the, to the United States, mainly because, as I'm sure you guys learned last year in Euro, a devastating potato famine swept uh, uh, to the island of uh, Ireland and were, was killing thousands of Irish. And, and thousands began to flee Ireland for the shores of the United States. But this raised a very stark contrast in lifestyle with the mainly predominantly uh, Protestant America. And not only was it the Irish immigrants that were flocking to the United States, but it was also thousands of Germans. So Irish and German immigrants began pouring in heavily to the United States in the 1840s. And that would soon eventually come with, with uh, Euro Eastern European immigrants and Italian immigrants and a lot of uh, Jewish immigrants um, from all over the world. But that's a little bit later. So for right now, think about in the 1840s, the predominant group groups of immigrants were, were Irish and Germans. And this truly aroused nativist sentiments to the fact that in the 1850s, for about a two-year period, a nativist political party formed, and they were known as the American Party, a.k.a. the Know Nothing Party. Now, where'd they get the name from? Well, it sort of would go like this. Hey, are you part of the Know Nothing Party? What do you mean? I don't know anything. Hint, hint. And that basically was code for the fact that you were an, an anti-immigrant, you were anti-Catholic, you were one of these hardcore nativists. And the Know Nothing Party formed... A small minority of politicians. There was, in fact, however, one member of Congress elected uh, under the Know Nothing Party. And hey, get this. In the presidential election of 1856, the Know Nothing Party actually launched a bid for the presidency with former President Millard Fillmore. But there was a catch. Fillmore was neither, one, a Know Nothing Party member, nor, two, an anti-immigrant, anti-Catholic politician. However, the Know Nothing Party just said, hey, Millard, why don't you just run for us? We'll see what happens. And... Phil, Fillmore did not fare very well in the election. But the irony is this, with Manifest Destiny becoming so pervasive and this new concept of the United States launching itself abroad, isn't it strange considering the fact that the United States was deep down at its core for the majority of Americans, a very nativist, very racist country in the making? The fact that immigrants were so uh, persecuted and targeted um, politically not just socially, but politically, says an awful lot about the makeup of the United States in the 1850s. And the Know Nothing Party's legacy will last quite some time, although the party did fade out. Anti-immigration will become a major theme throughout the 19th centuries. And hey, if you look at today, presidential election 2016, you think immigration is a dead issue? Think again. So there we have it. Manifest destiny uh, goes abroad in the 1850s, but at the same time, America is buckling down on its anti-immigration stance, and the rise of the Know Nothing Party is a good example of how in the 1850s the United States were becoming more anti-immigrant, more anti-Catholic than ever before. We'll come back at it tomorrow in class. I hope you guys have enjoyed this video. Remember, the past shapes the future. Have a great evening.